Thank you for coming to this session. Uh, we're very excited to be here, and thank you for coming to KubeCon. And today we'll talk about the CNCF tag runtime. We have a great lineup of speakers here, uh, each one of them working in different areas in the tag, different aspects. And I think it's going to be great to hear from them. Some of what we'll, we'll be talking about today, so we'll give you a brief overview of the tag. Then Alex will talk about the batch system initiative working group that he's working on. Then Kate will talk about the HIOT working group and her project, uh, Acri, she's a man maintainer of that project. Then Zipnet will talk about CADA, it's a CNCF project uh, in incubation and how he uses that or, or end users take advantage of that for auto scaling. And finally, Samuel will talk about a uh, confidential containers project that is in the confidential computing space and is used uh, to run workloads in a secure way. Okay, so what is the tag runtime or what are tags? Technical advisory groups that work closely with the CNCF TOC to help projects go through all these maturity levels and become more usable and become more, uh, more of uh, something that helps the cloud native ecosystem. So in essence, tag runtime specifically is related to machine, to, to workloads and to different types of these workloads, whether they're latency sensitive or whether they're batch re related workloads and all in the context of cloud native environments. So we work closely with the TOC. I'm one of the co-chairs. We also have tech leads that do things or, or do different diligence in, in, in the tech and they uh, uh, work closely together with the TOC, work closely with the, the community. And we meet every first and third Thursday of every month. And we're happy to have anybody join these meetings. Uh, the more participation, the better. And th the more participation helps the community and helps these projects grow. And our communications happens through email and Slack. So the scope of the TAC contains a lot of different projects. So there's a wide variety of them. Uh, you have the runtimes, you have the projects that allow you to run workloads uh, at the edge. You have things like confidential containers that allow you to run uh, containers in a secure way. You have things like CADA that allows you to run auto scaling you know, depending on different types of metrics. You have the traditional projects like Kubernetes and Containerd that just allow you to orchestrate workloads. And then we also have more specifically this different areas, the general orchest workload orchestration where Kubernetes is, uh, then there's the VMs and runtimes and containers type of projects or container registry type of projects. There's also the special operating systems, for example, the operating systems that allow you to run uh, just containers or lightweight operating, operating systems that are just meant for containers. There's this large space around edge, machine learning ops, and AI. And there's a lot of projects around that space that help um, users create those flows end-to-end -end, uh, for machine learning uh, models, creating those models and taking them to production. We also have this um, uh, space of, of serverless workloads, and we have some working groups and in the container orchestrated device and two working groups that are in progress, the batch system initiative that Alex will talk about and the HIOT working group that Kate would also talk about. So we've also had some presentations uh, since the last KubeCon. Uh, so the tag is continually expanding the set of projects and the scope and you know the engagement. So these are some of the examples of different projects in the different areas. So we're expanding on cluster management, how to, how to run multiple clusters in different clouds and 
different locations on-prem or in cloud service providers. We have different projects also to that help users run Kubernetes uh, at the edge, like K0S. We have things like um, uh, workload constraints and scheduling projects uh, to schedule certain Kubernetes pods uh, with, with certain constraints around latency or storage or, or different things. And then we have also the serverless type of workloads, projects that we'd had engaged in the community like, like Knative, which is in incubation in the CNCF right now. And right now I'll hand it off to Alex and he'll talk about the Bash system initiative. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, I'm Alex uh, from G Research, a quantitative research firm in the UK. And I'll talk to you about this batch system initiative. But I wanted to point out that it's Friday on the final day of the conference, long conference. It's just before lunch. I didn't think that I would be able to engage, enlighten, connect with you just if I had bare words on the page. So instead, I'm going to try and keep it interesting with some animals. This is a, uh, a batch of pandas, which English has all these words for special groups of, of animals. Pandas, this is an embarrassment of pandas. That's, that's what we call this. Uh, the history of the, the batch working group, we were, earlier this year, we, we came to at the TAG runtime group um, to discuss our own project, Armada, where we have a, a multi-cluster approach to batch scheduling. Um, and in the course of that conversation, it came up that uh, the runtime group had been uh, chatting with a bunch of other batch projects. And we're all sort of saying the same thing, and uh, that maybe we should have a separate conversation specifically around batch. At the same time, there's a, a, another batch initiative that I'll mention a little more later. Aldo talked about it yesterday, um, which is a Kubernetes batch conversation. And, um, and both of these conversations were happening. The, the, there's a Kubernetes batch working group, but it felt like there was space for this other batch conversation where people who are creating batch projects on top of Kubernetes uh, should come together and have a conversation. So that's the history and, and sort of what this is. And I'm wondering, oh, doop, doop. so this is sloths, and this is a bed of sloths. This batch of sloths is a bed of sloths. Um, the kinds of projects that we're talking about are, uh, I mentioned our multi-cluster approach called Armada. There's Volcano, which uh, you saw on a couple slides earlier. There's MCAD, IBM, there's Unicorn and Cloudera, there's Slurm is represented in the, um, in the conversation as well. So these are the kinds of projects that we want to be bringing together and, uh, and all communicating about where we're going uh, in, in the sort of batch world, either to join forces or just to compare notes or maybe just uh, emotional support. Yeah, we'll, we'll figure it out as it goes. Hedgehogs. Uh, does anyone know what, what the group of hedgehogs is? It's a prickle of hedgehogs, just to make sure. Um, and I wanted to point out here this more of the distinction between the Kubernetes batch working group and the CNCF batch working group, because it can be a little confusing. Uh, the Kubernetes batch working group will be more focused on lower level things, features that we need to get into Kubernetes to be able to support batch more natively. So uh, they've been working on uh, improving the jobs API. There's, uh, you might help me out, Aldo, but I think there's uh, all at once scheduling is next on the agenda and uh, features like that, that if we could get into Kubernetes, all of these higher level projects would be more capable, be able to, to uh, use Kubernetes better. Uh, whereas in this CNCF batch working group, we're talking more about the projects that have been built on top of Kubernetes, uh, largely because we couldn't actually do batch scheduling effectively with the, the features that Kubernetes has had up until now. So just trying to make that distinction just a little bit clearer. Um, but please, come to both, come to all. We'd, <laughs> if you're interested in this space at all, you may be interested in both. There's no problem with going to both. 
um, penguins. Um, what are my notes? Oh, oh yes, uh, penguins, they are a waddle of penguins. It's fun. Um, let's see, do I have... Um, with this one, there's flamingos. It's a flamboyance of flamingos. Um, and really, the, the last bit is to, to just join us in conversation. We've got a, uh, a schedule of every other week, we're having a, a meeting about the CNCF working group. It's on Mondays at 7.30 p.m., 7.30 a.m. Pacific time. Hopefully that lines up with everyone. Um, there's some information that you can get a hold of us. There's a Slack channel. There's this Zoom room. Every two weeks, we're, we'll be there chatting about stuff. Please feel free to reach out to us directly, either me or Klaus or uh, I think it's Alex, but wait, wait. Um, any of us three can direct you to how to get more involved in the conversation. Um, and these are otters, and otters were, oh, what, what, what are otters? They, a raft of otters, yes, thank you, thank you. Um, <laughs> the notes aren't coming up, and I needed the notes, but yes, a raft of otters. Hopefully that was as entertaining as I hoped it would be. Um, I think we can now move on to Edge and IoT. Lovely. Great. Thank you. So I'm going to transition us to talking about the IoT and Edge space. So our working group was previously a part of the Kubernetes space, and now we're moving to the runtime tag and the CNCF to a bigger and broader scope since there's a lot happening on the IoT and Edge space. So to start, I'm going to talk about some of the CNCF sandbox projects in this area. And then I'll talk about one more in particular and then tell you how to get involved if any of this interests you. So when we talk about the cloud, um, everything is homogeneous there. A lot of the servers are the same. They're in a static environment. But when you move to the edge, um, there's a variety of devices with differing compute. And ranging from the larger compute, we have those servers that are on-prem on, on the edge. And more and more, people are wanting the same level of orchestration that they can have in the cloud for their workloads on the edge. So there's several CNCF projects that are aiming to provide this. So CubeEdge, OpenYurt, SuperEdge, they're enabling you to have that Kubernetes experience from the cloud to the edge where sometimes the characteristics are air-gapped and there's other unique th um, things that you're concerned with on the edge. Um, also, some of these servers have less compute, so they themselves are more constrained, and so the Kubernetes um, distro that you're deploying there needs to take up less resources. So another project that handles this is K3S. They kind of slim down Kubernetes so that you can run it on some of these smaller servers that are um, processing all that data around the environment on the edge. Also, when we talk about the edge space, more and more there's a discussion of WebAssembly on the server. Um, and that's because when you make your applications, WebAssembly modules instead of containers, they're smaller. It's a binary that's portable across different OSs and platforms, and it has quick startup time and better security, or just as good of security. Um, so there's a couple of projects in this space, Wasm Cloud and Wasm Edge, that are helping you deploy those WebAssembly modules both in the cloud and on the edge. So then as you move to smaller compute, you have those smart devices, those IP cameras, and um, these devices have a little extra compute on them where you may be able to embed some extra workloads on them. And so there's some talk happening in this space of maybe, in, maybe putting a WebAssembly runtime on these devices and adding some modules there. And so that's work that's kind of being discussed and explored right now that, um, to keep your eye out in for the future. And then finally, on the edge, we get to these really small constrained devices that kind of have one fixed function. These are sensors, controllers, um, devices that just have enough compute to do exactly what they need to do. And so we can't put any extra workloads on them, so the question becomes, how can we then easily get data from these devices and let, let our applications running on our servers on the edge leverage that? And one um, CNCF sandbox project that I work on aims to solve this problem. It's called Aukri. It stands for a Kubernetes resource interface, and it's that interface that abstracts away the details of discovering IoT devices on the edge, and then it represents them as native Kubernetes resources in your cluster. And it then can automatically deploy workloads to use your workloads to use those devices. 
So just how in your pod spec you could request CPU and memory, Aukri enables you then to declaratively request an IoT device. So an IP camera, a USB thermometer, um, a robot arm. Um, so it's extending that declarative nature of Kubernetes to these IoT devices. And it's purely Kubernetes native, so it runs on any Kubernetes distro. And you can learn more about it in the documentation there, too. So if any of these projects interest you, um, please come join the working group. Like I said, we're transitioning right now from Kubernetes to CNCF. So we're changing all of our locations of where our Slack exists, where our GitHub page is. So um, a good place to start would be to join our current Slack. All the conversation will happen there. And we do have bi-monthly meetings that we're continuing to have during this transition. And um, as a part of this, we're building out a new charter to kind of draft what area this, that we're filling. And um, we're really just, in general, trying to build cohesion around all the heterogeneity of all the devices and compute and workloads that are happening on the edge. So if that interests you, um, please come join. And with that, I will transition us over. Hello everyone, my name is Zbigniew, I'm from Red Hat. Uh, I'm working on Knative and Keda projects, so I will speak up specifically about this project. So, and unfortunately I don't have any animals in the slides, so I wouldn't beat you, but no. So, uh, what is Keda? Like, what is the aim of this project? So, what we are trying to do is basically to make Kubernetes event-driven auto-scaling very simple, very user-friendly, so you don't have to configure anything, almost just, you know, a couple of lines of code and that's all. Um, with that, uh, we can auto-scale Kubernetes deployments, or we can even schedule new jobs based on some events happening in, in uh, external service. So imagine you have some external service that is processing some, messi some, messaging, some messages, and you would like to process them. So sometimes you might need to use jobs or deployments based on the, based on the type of workload that you would like to prefer. Uh, one of the benefits of, of this approach is that we are able to uh, scale the resources down to zero. So you can save resources on your cluster. And we have connectors to more than 50 different adapters, different external services that you, you can use uh, to scale on. So we have connectors to Kafka, Prometheus, RabbitMQ, some AWS services, etc. So to give you like the very specific, or to describe the, the idea on, on this example, so this is a very simple example application that uh, consume messages from some external system. So in this case, it is a Kafka consumer application that consumes messages from Kafka topic. And OK, we, we have this application deployed on our cluster, and we would like to auto-scale this application. So what are our options if we, are using, if we are using Kubernetes and we would like to use some, you know, let's say, default tools? So then you need to use HPA. But the problem with HPA is that uh, it only can scale based on CPU or memory. And if you are having like this, this kind of applications that are more event-driven, this is not, might be the best fit for you to actually do the scaling because the CPU or memory consumption may not correlate with the actual needs for scaling because you would like to scale the application based on the, uh, based on the stuff on the external service. So in this case, um, based on um, unprocessed messages in the Kafka topic. So uh, this is the very same use case, very same example, but we are using Keda in this moment, so you don't have to change anything in the application, anything in the, in the Kafka broker setup. You just, uh, you just set up Keda, and you very easily can define that, okay, let's scale this deployment based on the metrics from this Kafka broker, and it should, it should do the job. So basically, we are building on top of HPA, but we are extending the capability, and uh, we are trying to do it as, as simple as possible, because the previous iteration of similar approach that was using a custom metrics for HPA. Uh, it's quite hard to actually configure this stuff from the user, user perspective, so we are really trying to make it very simple for users. And this is about the project. So the project itself started as a collaboration between Microsoft and Red Hat a couple of years ago. Uh, then we transitioned to CNCF, and we are incubating an incubation phase at the moment. And uh, I would like to say that it uh, really helped the project a lot, like moving to CNCF because we have all the support and all the all the needs that we need to you know to cover. Uh, we do releases every every uh, three months approximately, and we are meeting every every other week. So you are feel free to join the community and extend the extend the stuff. These are some some users that are using using our stuff on production 
and they are happy with it. So thank you. Thank you. Oops. So we're only a few slides away from lunch, so bear with me. It's going to be fine. OK, um, I'm going to talk about uh, confidential computing. Uh, I'm Samuel, I work for Apple, and I work on a, uh, a project called Confidential Containers. I just recently got uh, accepted as a uh, CNCF sandbox project. And um, I'm going to talk about, about confidential containers and another project called Inclaver, which are the two uh, CNCF sandbox projects that actually try to make confidential computing a part of Kubernetes. And the idea with those two projects is really to take a Kubernetes workload, a pod, and make it run in a confidential enclave. It can be a TDX, a AMD SCV, SGX, uh, whatever. But really the idea is to say um, we want each and every workload, each and every pod, to get its own dedicated enclave. And that this, is, this is very different from um, what a lot of, C not, not a lot, but many CSPs are currently offering, which is uh, confidential computing nodes. So they give you a node, a Kubernetes node, and that's running inside a confidential computing VM. What we're doing here is we give each pod its own confidential computing VM. So each and every one of your pods is separated through a confidential enclave. So why do we do this? Um, it's all about protection. Um, it's not about making workloads secure, it's about making them more secure than what you currently have with your regular uh, Kubernetes security setup. Uh, we're protecting workload from the host. Uh, that's the very, the most important promise from uh, confidential computing. So basically, with confidential containers, we are removing the host from the TCB. You're running your Kubernetes uh, pod in uh, your uh, Kubernetes cluster, and you do not have to trust the, the, the CSP anymore. You basically don't have to trust about what it's providing you with, um, uh, your, your kernel, your workload, your pod, your container images. Everything is now running inside a confidential computing enclave and can be verified, attested, and measured by you as a guest owner, as a, as a workload owner. We're also protecting from, uh, uh, offering protection from the other workloads. Uh, each and every one of your pod has now its dedicated enclave. So, uh, a uh, uh, pod to pod protection is guaranteed by hardware and by the confidential computing hardware. So, as I said, uh, we're looking at two projects uh, that are CNCF sandbox projects that are working on confidential computing. The first one is confidential containers, uh, and again, this is give you, giving you uh, one confidential enclave per pod. Uh, it supports multiple uh, hardware implementation of confidential computing. TDX, SGX, SCV, SE, all of those are coming from different silicon vendors and are the main confidential computing implementation right now. Uh, the other project is Inclaver, and Inclaver is uh, working at a different granularity. Uh, it basically provides an enclave per container. So you can run a pod with multiple containers, and typically one of them will run inside an SGX enclave, because this, um, uh, this is not as... Uh, uh, it, it doesn't support multiple hardware like, like Comfetch containers, it only supports Intel SGX. So it's a different, different approach, uh, it's more granular, um, but it's, it's less flexible. Confidential containers, uh, that's the high-level diagram, lots of buzzwords, lots of boxes. Um, I want to make sure you don't understand this, uh, so you go come back to me and ask questions. Um, so basically, and really, I, I mean, the, the idea here, I mean, the, the couple ideas that I want you to, to take back is, again, you have a pod, it's running inside a confidential VM. So this is protected by confidential computing at the pod level. Uh, and this is a virtual machine. Uh, each and every confidential computing implementation uses virtual machine as its uh, basic unit of instantiations. And this is using, uh, right now, the Kata container runtime. So you're using Kata container runtime to create a confidential computing VM and run your pod inside that, that VM. Uh, the big difference between Kata containers is the, the, left, the right hand side of this, of this diagram, where we run the entire attestation. And last but not least, the containers images in that architecture, they're living in the guest. So the host never sees container images anymore. Kubernetes itself doesn't touch, pull, or mount, or seize, or modifies any of your container images with that architecture. 
Come back to me if you want more details. Come back. Enclaver uh, is the second one. Um, it's, again, slightly different. And you can see that uh, you have multiple runtime for, for uh, multiple, uh, many of your containers. So you can have a Run-C container, which is just a regular container, uh, the same thing that you would run on any Kubernetes pod. And then you have something different there, um, uh, the top, uh, the right-hand side at the top, where you see that one of your container, one of your application, is running inside an enclave. Um, and this is really an SGX enclave. At, it, it, it only supports uh, Intel SGX. So this is, this is quite different from the computational containers, um, but it leverages computational computing to protect part of your workload uh, uh, with Kubernetes. Join us. Um, this is our GitHub. Every Thursday, we have a meeting on Zoom. Um, we're a CNCF sandbox project, so we have our own Slack room and everything. We, we just very buzzy. Um, so yeah, join us, help us, contribute, come if you have any interest. Thank you. So we have about 10 minutes for questions. Unfortunately, we don't have anything from online yet. So yeah, one second. Uh, so this question is for uh, Alex. Um, you had a great, all the great, you know, bunch of animals, uh, groups of animals. So I'm really curious um, if we have an English name for a, set, a group of uh, Kubernetes clusters yet. Uh, a mess. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good. Uh, I mean, maybe, maybe the uh, the name for the group of goldfish. Oh, there you go. Uh, which is a troubling of goldfish. That might apply to Kubernetes. I don't know. That's I think we should take a vote on this. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so for the well, so for the working group in the runtime, is your are you, like so? Are we attempting to keep up to date on the like the Kubernetes constructs like Q and others, and talk about integration with these as part of this? Sorry, this is for Alex. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and sorry, so for which for this working group, the the batch initiative as opposed to the Kubernetes one, or um, yes, yes, yeah, so sort of. Um, I mean, the, the conversation is growing as we speak, so it's not. Uh, yet very well defined, but in general, I imagine that we will uh, be keeping up to date on what all of the various projects are doing, uh, how we're uh, reacting to the, the changes that the batch Kubernetes group are implementing in Kubernetes, uh, if there are any ways that we can collaborate and, and join forces. That's how I imagine our conversation at the CNCF level um, taking place. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my question is for Kate. Um, I think you mentioned that the Edge um, working group migrated from Kubernetes to CNCF. Can you give us some insight of uh, why and uh, yeah, wh what were the benefits or why were you limited at uh, within Kubernetes? Yeah, so the question being, why did we migrate from the Kubernetes working group to the CNCF, right? Yeah, so when we're talking about the edge, some of these projects uh, that we mentioned aren't all Kubernetes specific. And in general, we uh, our working group presentation that we gave the other day, we talked about, for example, um, secure device onboard. There's discussions of how do we onboard um, and provision servers at the edge. That discussion is not Kubernetes specific. It's specific to all technology um, that we're talking about on the edge. And so it really was an opportunity to kind of expand beyond the Kubernetes space as we talk about um, handling these both constrained IoT devices and larger servers that are running on the edge. Does that answer your question? I have a, I have a question for Samuel. Um, I wanted to know what the performance impact of running your workloads in a confidential container, especially in terms of IO, with gas memory, disk, network? Um, I, I think uh, it, it it depends on it depends on the on the silicon implementation. So I'm I'm not going to talk on behalf of the uh, silicon vendors. Uh, Samuel, we lost your voice. 
Okay, sorry. Um, but if you're, if, and that's, that's not really related to computational computing itself, but it's more related to hardware virtualization. If, you're, if your workload is heavily I.O. bound, this is probably the worst case scenario for running anything, not only containers, but any workload inside a virtual machine. If, you're, if, you're, if your workload is I.O. bound and you do, you do, you do not do a direct device assignment, Basically, you don't have ac direct access to your GPU or your networking card or your uh, disk. Then you're going to do a lot of memory um, uh, and VM exits, basically, and it's going to cost you a lot. Um, but that's not related to computational containers. It's more related to hardware virtualization itself. Uh, computational containers adds uh, latency in terms of boot time because you, you, you do have to do, to do the remote attestation if you want to be able to verify what you're running. Um, that's... Uh, it, it highly depends on the kind of attestation you're running, uh, and it potentially adds uh, uh, overhead when running with memory encryption. But this is typically, according to silicon vendors, again, very, very minimal. So they, the, the whole memory encryption is hardware implemented in the memory controller, so the overhead is, is very, very small, uh, typically not measurable in a, in a meaningful way. So hope it answers the question. And we have time to do it. You mentioned the, uh, um, the SGS extension, the Intel extension for implementing the secure memory regions. Do you know, um, do other, uh, other vendors of like x86 compatible systems and as more especially um, like ARM version 8 or version 9 have analogous extensions for secured regions of memory? Uh, I think from what we see is that, is that all the vendors are actually m kind of moving away from this, this kind of implementation, the SGX, TrustZone kind of implementation where you have these uh, application uh, boundaries, and they're going into the SCV, TDX, and ARM v9 is, is, is really providing the same, uh, the same architecture, basically saying we are going to extend the hardware virtualization ISA, the instruction set, to support computational computing through memory encryption, uh, measurement and attestation, and also protecting the, the CPU states, uh, your caches, your registers. So this is basically taking the current hardware virtualization implementation and extending it to support computational computing. And this is very, very different from SGX, from TrustZone, from all those uh, uh, implementation. And this is where I, the industry is going. If you look at ARM v9, which is the next uh, uh, ARM uh, 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 design. Uh, it's not instantiated yet. But if you look at ARMv9, a, a big part of the feature set is just that. Being able to run confidential computing with ARM and being able to do that as a, as a hardware virtualization extension. So.